Anybody excited about going to heaven? It's an easy question at church because you're hoping the people here are counting on going to heaven. I've met a few people in my life that told me I don't want to go to heaven, don't care, happy to go to hell. But almost everybody you meet on some level hopes to go to heaven, mostly because it's a better option than the alternative. But for some of us, we're actually in love with Jesus and really hoping to see him face to face. But what's interesting to me about heaven is a lot of us want to go there. A lot of us are thinking for sure we are going there, but not many of us know a lot about heaven. And I really can't unpack all of what heaven is in a short message today, but I want to at least paint a picture today for what heaven is. And I want to talk about a few of the things that you can't do in heaven. We talked about last week that our lives are brief. Remember that? Five seconds. And we're out of here. Life is short and eternity is long. So if there are things you can't do in the length of eternity that you can do in the brevity of your time on earth, it would be a wise move to do the things you can't do in eternity while you've got an opportunity on earth. So heaven, what's it like? A few things just to describe it and you can dig more in if you would like to, but heaven is real, A, and heaven is brand new. I love the way that Revelation shows us this when John is getting this picture of heaven. Last week, we looked at the, the weighty part in the end of chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Now, just if we can jump in just for a moment here, this is helping us understand that any mentality that says, when I die, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to give God a big high five, that's not the way it's going to play out right away. Any kind of a mindset that says, man, I was just talking to the man upstairs. I'm telling you, there is no man upstairs. The one that's upstairs is sitting on a great throne and in his presence, earth and everything else flees. And that's where we're all going to be at the end of our lives. And in that moment, time is done. It, it's, it's not unlike the Braves game today. We all know, depending on the score, it's going to play out either in the top of the ninth or the bottom of the ninth or extra innings after three outs, three strikes, or an out in the outfield. That's when the game ends. And when the game ends, they record it in a box score, and there's no alterations at that point, and nobody protests. There aren't people camping outside the stadium going, hey, we think we should get one more out. We think we should get one more inning. We think we should get to play again uh, uh, and, and continue this game because, you know, I went 0 for 4, and I really wasn't dialed in today, and I really want to get a, another shot at changing the outcome of this game. None of us think anything about that. We're like, no, it was a deal. And we all understood it walking into it. And now it's over and it's recorded and you can Google it. Same with everything else in life. You had a deadline for that project you were working on at work. The deal either had to be done by this time or not. And if it wasn't done here, then the deal went away. And that's just the way the terms were. And everybody got it. Everybody understood it. And the moment came and the deal's done. And there's no, hey, you know what? I really didn't bring my A game to the deal. And this is the way life is. And God in his kindness today isn't just sending us off to, you know, just flitter away through life. He's telling us there's a moment coming when you breathe your last breath and you stand before the God of all of heaven. And yes, he's a God of love. He's defined by love. He is love. But he's also holy and righteous and perfect and filled with awe. And the foundations of the world shake in his presence. And that's the moment we're all moving toward. And when it comes to eternity, we all want to interject and say, it's not fair that it just ends like that. Surely God gives us another chance. It's not fair that it could just be over and then recorded in a box score. C certainly God doesn't work like that when everything else in life works like that. And God is trying to help you and me understand today that that's the way eternity works. And that's why he's being so kind in his word to talk so much 
about eternity so that we can make the five seconds we have on earth count and we can be happy for the eternity that we spend with him. He says, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them and I saw the dead, great and small. I mean, the most famous person on earth and the most infamous person on earth standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, that lake of fire that was prepared for the devil himself. And the lake of fire is the second death. So this is what we really want to be concerned about. Everybody here is going to face the first death, but some people are going to face the second death, and that's what you really want to allow God to give you grace to avoid. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, as abrupt and terrifying and weighty and troubling as that phrase is, I don't want you to allow the enemy to get you tripped up on how can God allow someone to spend an eternity without him. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to get you linked into the reality that God himself has come down in human flesh, writing with a pen in his hand by the blood of his own son, anyone's name who wants their name written in the book of life, he will write it. All you have to do is say to him, I am a sinner and I recognize that you have sent a savior and you are offering grace, mercy, forgiveness, and kindness. I choose you. I accept you. Please forgive me and save me and bring me to life and write my name in the book of life and God Almighty will do it. He will write it. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what your story, your record, your history, your wrongs, he will write your name in the book of life. So do not let the evil one get you all twisted up in some philosophical conundrum about how God could allow people to spend eternity separated from him when God right now is pleading with the world. Have your name written in the book of life. And then John goes on. He says, turning the page a little bit into chapter 21, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things is passed away. He, was, he who was seated on the throne said, can you just say these words with me? <clears throat> Do you see them? I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. What do we know about heaven? We know it's new. It is new. It is brand new. It is a new heaven and a new earth. We're not just going to be absorbed up into the clouds. There's going to be a do-over for planet earth. The one that we corrupted by our sinful choices is going to be made over again in the way God intended it in the first place. And you're going to be made new. This is what 1 John 3 says. It says, uh, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear children, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You're getting an upgrade, people. 
You're like, oh, I'm pretty happy. I had some work done, I'm, you know, in, in relatively good shape. I kind of like the stage I'm in, like my hair, what it's doing right now. Um, so I feel pretty good. No, you are getting a major upgrade. It's going to be new. Second thing about heaven, just touching on these really quick, it's tangible. So it's not ethereal. It's not those angels that we see on the greeting card where one's looking over and the other one's kind of looking off in the distance. It's not that. It's not a harp recital. It's not floaty through the sky. It, it's, it's real and tangible, not just some by and by. That's not a great description for where we're going. It's not the by and by. It's a new heaven and a new earth. It's meaningful. In other words, you don't have to worry about just standing around, you know, singing hymns for the rest of forever. And I know that's not bad, but some of you really don't love the music, okay? I, I, I get that. Some of you really don't consider yourself a worshiper in that sense. And, you know, for you, the 15, 20 minutes we sing at church feels like forever to you sometimes. And you're like, man, if this is heaven and we're just going to do that forever, whoa! <laughs> Whoo! Well, A, you need to love that more. <laughs> so that's, that's A. Because that's about God and you love God. That's singing to God. That's not just singing in the car, which you do love, by the way. <laughs> this is singing to God and you love God and God is in heaven. He is in the midst of heaven. So if, you don't, if, if God isn't that interesting to you or if it's a little bit on the boring side, then, then you, you, you need to start rethinking heaven. Because he's in the midst of it. That's the last thing on, on the list that I wanted to mention. It's God-centric. In other words, he is the star attraction of heaven. doesn't mean we're all standing around a circle singing songs to him for all of eternity because it's a new heaven and a new earth and there are things to do on the new earth just like he gave Adam and Eve things to do on the first earth. Meaningful things. Running stuff, being in charge of stuff, being stewards of stuff, creating stuff, co-creating with God on earth. This is the plan, and it's going to be meaningful for you. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just one second. It's going to be personal. You're going to know people there. People are going to know you. We're not just going to be some angelic beings floating around in the by and by. You're going to go, oh, hey, I know you. And people are going to look at you and go, hey, I know you. It's going to be enjoyable. I think the enemy kind of low-key has got it being not that enjoyable. It's going to be enjoyable. You're like, enjoyable like what? We just went to Switzerland, and it was the greatest trip we've ever been on in our lives. Is it going to be as good as that? Yeah. You are not going to be in heaven going, oh, honey, remember how amazing it was when we were in Grindelwald? <laughs> no. You're going to be going, this is Grindelwald on steroids. This is Grindelwald, and my feet don't hurt. And this is Grindelwald, and I don't have a sinus infection right now from the flight over. This is Grindelwald, and I'm not jet lagged. This is Grindelwald, and there wasn't a, a, an annoying person on the tram with us. All I can't paint the specifics. I'll tell you this. Whatever is your jam is going to be blown away by heaven. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to wish more people you knew were at it. It's out of this world. Literally out of this world. There are a few things that you're not going to find there. There's no preaching there. You should get an amen for that. <laughs> I don't know. I've been rethinking this a little bit because I've been joking about this for a long, long time. You've all heard me say it. No preachers in heaven. And then I realized I needed to redact that and clarify a little bit because there are going to be a few preachers in heaven. I don't know how many, but some. And um, so it's not no preachers in heaven. It's no preaching in heaven. But then I started realizing preachers like preaching. So there might be a day in heaven where all the preachers get together and just preach. Now, you're not coming to it. I understand that. But there would be some people that would come to that. But I guarantee you there's no litigators in heaven. So if that's your thing, you need to start working on a side hustle. There's no funeral directors there. No grave diggers in heaven. No headstone engravers in heaven. No cancer researchers. 
No drug makers. No open heart surgeons. Not in heaven. Who is there? Well, Jesus was in that parable of the 10 minas. He, this noble man was going away to be anointed king and coming back. And when he left, he called 10 people and he gave them each a mina. Mina is like three months' wages. And he said, I want you to steward this while I'm gone. I'll be back. And when he came back, he said, Bring the 10 guys. And the first guy came and said, and he said, where's, where's my mina? He said, well, I took your mina and turned it into 10 mina. So he took the three months wages and turned it into 10 times three months wages. And the, the king, who's now been anointed, comes, comes to him and says, well, way to go. You have been faithful. Do you know this phrase? With a little. So I'm going to make you in charge of what? Of Much. Thank you. you, you have been faithful with this small thing I gave you, so now I'm gonna give you a big thing. And he says to him, you're gonna rule over 10 cities. So this is a picture of heaven. This is a picture of the second coming of Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus saying to me, Louis, I'm gonna give you a minor right now. In other words, everything you've got, I gave you anyway. I would like you to steward it well till I come back as king. And when I come back as king, you're gonna show me what you did with what I put in your hands. And then I'm gonna put you in charge of things. Wow. So we know in heaven there's management, there's administration, there's creation of things, co-creating in the new world with God, which means there's developers in the new world. I think that implies could be architects and growers and painters and content creators and designers and landscapers and builders and musicians and cooks and hosts and florists and placemakers and dog groomers. Just try to slip that in, see if everybody be okay with that because London is going to need to get groomed. <laughs> you're like, now you're talking about the thing I've been hoping you talk about. This whole collection is my pet going to heaven. I cannot say authoritatively whether your pet's going to heaven unless it's a cat. <laughs> is that too much? Okay, we'll let your cat in because all things are made new. So I won't be allergic to it. In um, Isaiah 11, this is a prophecy and it says the, the, the leopard and the kid are gonna lie down together and the wolf and the lamb are gonna lie down together. It is projecting that there are for sure animals in the new world. So if they're going to be animals in the new world, I'm thinking it's a good bet that some of our pets that we love are going to be in the new world if they're going to be animals there. Paul said the whole creation is groaning for the redemption of all things. And I can't say 1,000%, but I'm going to go with dog groomers in heaven, <laughs> ski slope operators. Heaven is going to be a place where we are co-creating in the new earth with God in our midst. And it's gonna be meaningful. I say this mostly to the, to the doers, the people that are making stuff happening, the people that are getting things done, the people that are breaking ground and taking territory and inventing things and building things and developing things and pushing envelopes. You're not gonna be bored in heaven. But there's seven things you can't do in heaven. So in the five second window, there are things you can do for God to show your thanks to God. There, there are ways you can take your mina and you can return it to God in gratitude for all that he's done for you that you cannot do forever in eternity. So just to skip to the end really fast, if there are things you can do to honor God in the five seconds that you can't do in the forever, when you get to the forever, you're going to wish you did in the five seconds the things that you can't do forever. And the first one is this, you can't say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior in heaven. The box score will already be posted by then. And so if you want to say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have to do it in the five seconds you have called life on earth. And that's a word. That's a word. That's a word. Some of you are going to say, why didn't 
I say yes. I even, by the grace of God, ended up at that church on that day when that guy was talking about this very thing. And I sat there and I rationalized and I just wrestled and I let the enemy get me all distracted. Right now, right here, right now, you can change your eternity and upgrade significantly your time on planet Earth by joining your life to the life of Jesus Christ and allowing him to be the Lord of your life. You can say yes to his grace and his mercy and his love right here and right now. That's one thing you cannot do in heaven. It's over, people. There is a time coming. There is a moment of reckoning. There is a place called accountability, and there is a decision that is made for eternity. The second thing that you cannot do in eternity, you can't do in heaven, is pray prayers that shake the gates of hell. You realize that Jesus is building the church, and he said the gates of hell are not going to withstand this church that I'm going to build. In other words, we're in a contentious season right now. It's darkness versus the things of Almighty God, and we are authorized in this contentious season by calling on the name of Jesus to push back darkness, to shake hell itself, that you, on your knees, in Jesus' name, can launch missiles into the darkness. You can see people set free. You can see people redeemed. You can see your neighbors change. You can see the works of the enemy exposed and torn down. You can be a player in this moment. But once we're in heaven, the gates of hell are closed, and it's it. And there's no more hell-shaking prayer for eternity. And I'm telling you, in a moment like that, when it all comes clear, we're going to go, why didn't I shake hell while I could? Because now the gates to hell are closed. Three of the things you can't do in heaven is you cannot lift the poor in heaven. There's no Love Atlanta week in heaven. There's no opportunity to go to the disadvantaged, to the downtrodden, to those who've been oppressed, to those who are in prison, and to say to them, by God's grace, I am an ambassador to God, and I want to extend my hand and lift you up out of whatever is holding you down. In this little moment, you can do that every day. But in heaven, no one lifts the poor. This is why Jesus said, I've come to do exactly that. And if you want to walk with me, you want to be with me, you want to journey through life with me, guess what? A whole lot of what we're going to be doing together is lifting up the poor and lifting up those who've been run over by life and lifting up those who cannot get up by themselves. And we're going to do as much of it as we can while we can because there's a day coming when everything's made New. The fourth thing that you cannot do in heaven is to share the gospel and see when someone put their faith in Jesus. Has anybody ever been there and been the ambassador of God, the translator of the gospel? I mean, you and somebody, when they said, I want that, and you said, great, I can help you take that step of faith, and you were the one who opened the word, prayed the prayer, helped them pray, and when the amen happened and they were born again, son or daughter of God, you were the one that God was using in that moment to see them come to life. Have you ever had a moment with that, like that with anybody I mean, to say it a different way, have you ever led anyone to Jesus? I mean, yes, partly I was in the invitation. I helped them come to a thing. I sent them a resource. And so, yes, I'm in the economy of God. But have you been the one where they were looking at you saying, okay, I've heard you. I, I, I see what you're saying. I want that. Can I, can I make that decision right now? And you said, yes, let's pray right now. And we all should say yes, by the way, right now. And maybe that's what the church needs more than anything is for all of us to wake up to this understanding that we are God's ambassadors as if we were inviting the world to him. Or he was, the way Paul said it, he was inviting the world to himself through us. Therefore, we are now the agents of reconciliation on earth. I I pray, I pray, dear God, that everybody who hears this message will at some point in their life have the joy of leading someone else to Jesus. 
if not multiple, 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 multiple times. This is the, the greatest thing that you can think of. You're like, well, Louis, I'm not an evangelist. I, I don't have that kind of personality. I'm not super outgoing. I'm not super confident. I don't really know if I know how to lead somebody to Jesus. So that's not really my gift. I'm a prayer or I'm a giver. I'm a leader. I'm a server. And, and all that's great. But all of us at some point are carriers of the best news on planet Earth. Surely somebody at some point is going to go, I don't know. Something's happening to you, and I'd like to know what it is. Jesus, okay, great. I'd like to know how to know him then. Great, you can help me? Great, let's do it. What does that mean? Get saved like right now? Okay, I'm ready. Awesome. There's nothing, or, I mean, just think about it. What on your five-second resume is gonna top out above I led my neighbor to Jesus. And they are now in the forever because of that moment. And then once we're into the forever, and the coast is clear on sharing your faith. <laughs> Not ever happening. That's something that we have the privilege of doing with our mina in the five second life. A few more, seven of these. Number five, choose obedience. There's no fork in the road in heaven. If you're a teenager here today, you get that. If you're, if you're a human being here today, you get that. There's no fork in the road in heaven where we go, hmm, okay, I could do it God's way, but man, that other way looks pretty fantastic. Mm-mm, it's none of those. Even the thing of coming to church today, some of you chose obedience today, right? You didn't feel it. Your circumstances didn't amen it, but you said, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna get dressed and I'm going to the house of God and I'm gonna praise God today. Not because I feel like it, because I'm choosing obedience today. I'm choosing to worship him today. I'm choosing where I could have the world. I am choosing to follow Jesus. I'm choosing obedience. Won't ever get to do that in eternity. So if you want to show God with your mina that you want to choose him over every other thing this world has, then you have to do that in the five seconds. The sixth thing is to leverage your resources for eternal causes. Now, you probably saw this one coming, but there is no generosity moment in heaven. There is no giving moment in heaven. In fact, that book is closed. Jesus said, we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. So once the moment comes where we breathe our last breath, whatever we have advanced into our earthly, I mean, our heavenly kingdom is there, and it is done. That's the record. And so your eternity in terms of your position, status, and resources are going to be set the moment you take your last breath based on what you have shipped ahead. And, and I know I'm going to look back at the five seconds and go, why didn't I move more, A, for my eternal sake? Jesus said that. So it's not a bad thing for you and I to think, wow, I want to make sure I'm laying up for myself treasures in heaven so that when I get there, I'm not bankrupt, A, but I also know that in laying up the treasures in heaven, I can impact the two things that last forever, the word of God and the souls of men. I want to see eternal things change because of my finances and my resources. I'm not looking at a QR code on a screen going, well, you know, church has been pretty good to me. I should give a little. No, I'm looking at my mina in my hand that was a gift from Almighty God, and I'm going, I, I just want to make sure I steward this well, and I'd love to turn it into tenfold or a hundredfold or a thousandfold or ten thousandfold to say, thank you, God, because I'm not doing any of that in eternity. I'm getting a reward from you but what I have to offer you, I've already given. And the box stores is posted. And then the last thing, and this one's a little bit interesting for, for us as we're moving into more of a conflicting season. You cannot face persecution for the sake of Jesus in heaven. If you're going to do that, you do that now. And facing persecution is an amazing way that we give back to God and glorify God for him facing persecution for us. It's how we bear witness with our Savior. And again, it's maybe one of the reasons why we're not all as completely locked into him as we could be because we're living basically a pain-free life 
spiritually, but that's changing, right? Some of you maybe got passed over at work for a promotion because uh, you talked too much about Jesus or people knew you were a Christian or knew that you stood for the truth or maybe you got worked out of your job and ultimately somebody else got hired because there's a little too much Jesus in the equation or maybe right now you want to kind of navigate a certain career path but you know you've got to not step on a landmine with your faith in that career path or maybe it's just more obvious than that that you're in a place and time where you spoke up about Jesus and a big massive wave came back your way well count it all joy when you face persecution for my namesake a very famous person said that his name is Jesus And he said, and when you face it, just go, great. Don't go, oh man, I I don't don't know what's happening, I don't like this, just go, great. Because that means when my little five seconds that I had right here in the mina in my hand, I had the opportunity to say, hey, I don't know what this is gonna cost me, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him, by his love and grace and mercy. He has redeemed and saved me and given me a brand new life. That is my story. Oh, I will respect you if it's not your story. I'll respect you completely if you have a whole nother religious ideology. But I will not undercut the only grace on earth of a God who said, you don't have to make a way. I made the way for you. There's a whole forever. (laughs) Nobody faces persecution for standing up with Jesus. Not long ago, I was in one of the most storied venues in the world at a leadership event. There were 5,000 um, Christian leaders there from all over the world. And there was an interview coming in the morning and the person leading the conference said, I wanna invite um, a friend to come in just a moment. And uh, before I introduce her, I just want to say, please, no photographs, no video, no social media posts. This person is gonna be introduced by a, a name that is not actually her name because we're protecting her identity. And then a little bit of a description of this woman was given. It's a round venue and the stage kind of on one end, but circular, people sitting all the way around the top. and. As you came out to the stage, there was a tunnel that came from the back, and that's where all the people come in on and off the stage during the whole thing and been coming in and out of that tunnel. So where where we were sitting, there was a perfect shot into the tunnel. We were just at the right eye level, and we could see all the way to the back of the tunnel. So anybody coming around the hallway and starting onto the stage, we could see them before they got there. And I could see this, I don't know, maybe four foot six elderly woman standing in the tunnel. And then the person who was gonna do the interview said, the woman that I'm gonna introduce today that's coming is um, an amazing story of persecution and hardship. She's from North Korea. And at some point in late in her life, she escaped from North Korea into China. But the authorities found her in China and brought her back to North Korea and put her in prison as an escapee. This woman was a believer in Jesus. They didn't know that she was a Christian because if they knew she was a Christian, she wouldn't have got put in jail for escaping the country. She would have been executed on the spot. In Korea, North Korea, if you own a Bible, you get executed. If you're caught praying, you get executed. If you're caught talking to someone about Jesus, you get executed. If you're in any way look like you're networking believers together, you get executed. If you say out and speak out the gospel, you get executed. So they didn't know she was a Christian. And in North Korea, a lot of the Christians don't even know other people are Christians. But she had escaped the country, gotten caught in China, brought back, put in prison for three years when she was 60 years old. 
They put her in a cell that was supposed to have 50 women in it, but the cell she was in had 150 women in it. It's the most disgusting conditions. She talked about them, the food, the conditions, the sanitation, the toilet, the place where all these 150 women shared this toilet was just horrible. And she said, if you had to go to the toilet during the night, you would get up off the floor and immediately you would lose your spot on the floor just to go to the toilet. And then you would come back and have to stand for the rest of the night or maybe somebody else went to the toilet and you could try to negotiate another piece of floor. For three years, this woman is in this prison and she's being tortured. She talks about being beaten up. She talks about being mistreated in all kinds of ways. But in the prison, she feels like God is nudging her to start a church. And so she finally starts a conversation with another one of the prisoners and that prisoner gives their life to Jesus and they start meeting in the toilet because it's the most disgusting place. No one would go there except to go into the toilet quickly as they could and get out. And so they would go to the toilet and they would have a moment or two or three maybe together to talk about the Lord, to pray together, to maybe whisper a praise together and as soon as someone else would come in the toilet, the church would break up. And, but eventually another person put their faith in Jesus. And then another person put their faith in Jesus. And now they had a little clump in the toilet. And they would go in and they'd be lined up to use the toilet. And if anyone else came in, they would say, oh, we're all good. You go to the head of the line. And people in here didn't care. It was all, you know, get what you can. So a person would go to the front of the line. They would go to the toilet. Then they would leave and they'd be like, okay, we got another minute to have church. course they didn't get caught having the church or else all of them would have been executed and after three years this woman was released from jail from prison she escaped again again she escaped into China at mid 60s made it from China into South Korea and is now living in relative security in South Korea although her whole identity is still protected because agents could pick her up anytime anywhere in the world And especially now that her story is beginning to trickle out about the church that she started in the toilet, in the prison. And she was asked in the interview, what what is your main reflection on your time in the prison? And she said, I thank God for my time in the prison. For how would the people in the prison know Jesus if he didn't put me there? She got introduced and out she came. I could see her with her translator coming down the tunnel. And I don't think she'd ever been in a room like this room before. And as soon as she hit the stage, after just a brief introduction, she's been in prison, she's been... She started a church in the North Korean prison. As soon as she set foot on the stage, the place just erupted and it wouldn't stop. It wasn't just that, oh man, this is an amazing moment. It it wouldn't stop. And soon she was completely overwhelmed and tears just started flowing down her face. And after a long, long time, what seemed like eternity, everyone took their seats to the edge of their seats and she began to tell her story and I just thought oh my word and I thought dear God don't put me in line behind her in heaven my second thought, and this is a real thought, that's not like for a laugh, that's my first real thought. My second thought was, thank you that I still have another second or two. We talk about David and Esther, talk about Nehemiah. Jeremiah, Noah. We talk about Rahab and her faith. Talk about Deborah, who ruled justly. 
You talk about Paul and Stephen. You talk about the early builders. We call them the heroes of the faith. But we don't even know her name, her real name. She's one of them. you to be one of them. And when we come in the tunnel of the grace of God and heaven applauds, don't you want to be able to say, my five seconds were full of the things I knew I'd never be able to do for you again. And to hear him say, you know, people pass away and everyone writes on the Instagram, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Charles Stanley, and I'm pretty sure he was a good and faithful servant. But you see all the comments, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm just, you know, I honestly, and I get the spirit of all that, but none of us has the right to say that to anyone. Only God has the right to say that to anyone. Because only God knows the motives of our hearts. But I got a feeling that this uh, precious woman is getting a well done, good and faithful servant. Are you? There's still time to offer back to God an offering. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for talking about heaven, for talking about eternity, for talking about the stakes, for talking about the weight, for talking about our opportunity, for talking about our stewardship, for not leaving us down here just to blindly skip our way through earth. I pray, Holy Spirit, for an awakening. Just one of those moments where things shift, and not just for a day or for an hour, but I'm praying today for someone in this gathering that will be looking back decades from now on this little window of time and say, in that window, everything changed. That's when I determined that I would use my brief life to do the things that I could not do forever knowing that I've got all of forever to sit around the table with my friends, to enjoy a nice meal, to take in the scenery of earth. I have an entire forever to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb. But I just have a moment to make sure the people I love are going to be there. I pray for that kind of awakening today by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.